thank you everyone for joining us for another thrilling night of the colorectal surgery virtual education series. Uh, tonight we have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Barton uh, to talk about C. difficile colitis. Dr. Barton grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, go Cards, before attending Haverford College for undergrad and the University of Chicago for medical school. He completed his general surgery residency at OHSU in Portland, Oregon, and fellowship training at the colorectal clinic in Houston uh, with, with the University of Texas Houston group in 2014 to 15. After six years at LSU New Orleans, where he served as associate professor of clinical surgery and associate program director of the colorectal surgery fellowship, he relocated back to Oregon in late 2021 and now works for Kaiser Permanente. In his free time, he likes to hang out with his wife and two daughters, Alice and Rory, six and four respectively, and dog, Dr. Henry Jones Jr., AKA Indiana. Uh, he loves skiing in the winter and playing disc golf in the summer, and he has the thrilling topic of C. difficile colitis. Take it away. Thank you for that introduction. It is a thrilling topic for some of us, and I noticed a typo in my script over here, so I had to adjust that real quick. Um, and uh, thank you so much for that introduction. It was very generous. Uh, it's true. We did name our dog after Dr. Henry Jones Jr. so that we could say we named the dog Indiana because my wife and I are nerds. So I have the opportunity to talk about uh, Clostridioides difficile. Thank you again very much to the uh, Colorectal Virtual Education uh, Group for offering me this opportunity. It's very exciting for me on a personal level. I like giving this talk because it lets me make poop jokes for a long time. Quick outline, we're going to talk a little bit about the organism itself, sort of the uh, colorectal written boards type question information that's so painful and exciting. And then we'll talk about actual uh, C. diff associated diarrhea, the history, the epidemiology of some things. Uh, symptomatology, and then, uh, of course, uh, treatment options, including for acute disease, uh, both medical therapies and surgery, uh, recurrent disease, and then the elephant in the room. Anytime you talk about uh, C. diff is fecal microbiota transplantation or stool transplant. So we get to talk a little bit about that, which is always exciting. So first, uh, Clostridioides difficile is a gram-positive uh, spore-forming anaerobic bacteria. It is an obligate anaerobe. Uh, it was initially described in 1935, actually, so it's only been less than 100 years since C. diff was isolated and identified. Uh, this image shows electron uh, microscopic, uh, microscopic uh, view of it, which demonstrates its drumstick shape, which is kind of exciting. It's a rod or drumstick sometimes, or chicken drumstick, depending on how, hung how hungry you are right now. Uh, part of the reason it was initially identified as Bacillus difficile was because it was difficult to culture, and it was found to grow best at in blood agar for human blood at about human body temperature and only under anaerobic conditions. Uh, in about 1970, in the 70s, it was reclassified as a clostridium species. And then actually, and this is the fact that always blows resident minds, um, in 2016, it was reclassified as a clostridioides species instead. So when we talk about C. diff, we're not talking about clostridium difficile. As of 2016, we are technically talking about clostridioides difficile. Uh, and the clostridioides classification we'll discuss in a little bit the why and the how and the who. Uh, it is an obligate anaerobe as I said it's ubiquitous in soil. If you take any surface in the entire world and swab it there's a decent chance you can isolate C. diff from it because everything is covered in poop which is horrifying when you think of that. Uh, about three to five percent of humans are colonized but about 20 to 50 percent of hospitalized patients, healthcare workers, and so forth are colonized with C. diff in their colons. So the people who are listening to this talk right now Odds are pretty decent you got C, C. diff in your toilet too. Obviously, people who are in nursing or group homes are also at higher risk for having a C. diff colonization. Uh, it does transmit by a fecal oral route, which means that, you know, if you've ever seen a kid, they are disgusting and they always lick their hands and it's horrifying. So they all have C. diff too. Everything has C. diff, you know, be afraid, always be afraid. Um, they form acid resistant spores. So that's how the, the uh, bacterium actually survives the stomach acid. And then it's reactivated in the duodenum once it's exposed to bile salts, actually, which I think is really interesting. It comes out of its uh, vegetative spore state and into its actual cellular state. Um, obviously, we all know that this is a, a bacterium that's resistant to uh, alcohol-based sanitizers. And that observation actually developed from ICU settings where you would watch serially uh, each room develop C. diff over the course of several days as people were using alcohol-based uh, hand sanitizers. And so we found that a vigorous hand washing and actual dislodgement of the spore from the hands is the way to pre prevent uh, transmission. 
instead. So that's that's why we get to all wash our hands vigorously in the ICU once somebody has C. diff and maintain contact precautions until the uh, um, diarrhea is uh, abated and so forth. Uh, C. diff is, of course, one of the most, uh, the most um, common uh, cause of hospital-acquired diarrhea as well. The pathobiology of C. diff, this is the fun part because we get to look at uh, alpha helices and beta sheets and whatnot. Uh, there are two primary toxins that are produced by Clostridioides difficile, uh, enterotoxin, which is toxin A, and cytotoxin, which is toxin B. Interestingly, the two molecules are about 60% homologous, so they actually look fairly similar overall, and both function as cyclic GTPase inhibitors, uh, which leads to the uh, glucosylation of GTP, uh, ultimately leading to the failure of the actin skeleton of the uh, colonocyte in particular. Uh, the failure of that leads to loss of tight junction function, and yes, tight junction function, what's your function? You can make jokes about that. Uh, this leads to cell rounding, edema, a large inflammatory response, and loss of that edema fluid into the colon. Additionally, loss of uh, ability to absorb water that arrives at the colon, causing a watery diarrhea. Uh, both toxins A and B have been implicated in the actual causation of, of uh, the C. diff-associated diarrhea. Uh, it hasn't been elucidated which is the primary cause. Odds are it's both of them. They're very similar toxins anyway. But ultimately, this induces uh, apoptosis of colonocytes. Here's a nice schematic that actually came out of a paper from uh, uh, 2017 that looks at this. Uh, you can see that a lot of these, uh, the, there are domains that are the same until you get to the crop domains, which will come up later in discussion. And so you can just remember there are crop domains and then forget what they were shortly afterwards. Uh, but basically it shows that these bind to the end of epithelial surface of the colonocyte and then are, uh, uh, are um, uh, absorbed by endosomes. Uh, which then uh, ultimately activate them as they, uh, and then they bind to the row complex of the cyclic GTPase. Again, we don't actually know what surface receptor uh, toxin A and toxic B bind to at this point. It'd be, it'd be interesting for target therapy in the future, um, but ultimately this leads to failure of the colonocyte and cell death. Another schematic, this actually shows that the, uh, once the toxins are absorbed uh, and the, um, uh, epithelial cell dies, it actually leads to a massive inflammatory response that is, again, toxin-mediated. And perhaps the most important part of this entire uh, slide is the point where it shows that the bacterium is still resting comfortably in the lumen of the colon, not, uh, and it does not cause a bacteremia. Bacteremia with C. diff is actually exceedingly rare. Um, and so this is, it's important to note where the actual bacterium that's producing the toxin is in these situations. Uh, you can see this leads to mast cell activation, prostaglandin activation, TNF-alpha, et cetera, all of those inflammatory markers that most of us did our best to forget immediately after um, immunology in first or second year of medical school. There we go. Uh, so more recently, actually, a third toxin has been identified that's produced by virulent strains of C. diff called binary toxin. And this is the one that's actually most common in the, uh, commonly expressed in some of the more virulent strains, uh, NAP1B1027, 078, sometimes the 017 strain. Uh, this third toxin, the binary toxin, is part of what led this to be reclassified in 2016 as Clostridioides difficile instead of Clostridium difficile, actually. Uh, and this uh, toxin, binary toxin, has also been, also been identified in Clostridium perfringens. Uh, so it's interesting that they've, uh, that because of that, they've changed some of the classification of these uh, microbacteria. Uh, this one is an ADP uh, ribosyl transferase. Uh, it ultimately, again, leads to destruction of the actin cytoskeleton of the cells uh, in conjunction with the other um, uh, endotoxins. But more importantly, or equally importantly, it produces this weird microtubule protrusion formation. Uh, when these micro microtubules protrude, it's thought that C. diff, the bacterium, is actually able to better adhere to the colonocyte surface and to the colonic uh, lumen surface, which uh, allows it to continue to produce toxins directly adjacent to the injured endothelium, leading to this massive inflammatory response. Um, another reason that these uh, NAP1B1027 and 078 subtypes are actually more virulent is because they also have more copies of both toxin A and B, anywhere from 16 to 23 times more production in those sub and those ribotypes uh, than in most C. diff strains. So those are the ones that you actually see in these massive outbreaks, Montreal, uh, Hong Kong, London, et cetera, uh, where people get profound C. diff with uh, fulminant disease and death. Uh, 
they're also more commonly associated with fluoroquinolone uh, resistance, incidentally, which is important because of antecedent antibiotic use. Uh, all this leads to an increased immune response. Again, this is a toxin-mediated sepsis, not a bacteremia-mediated sepsis. So now we get to talk a little bit about the history of C. diff. It's interesting because uh, in 1968, clindamycin was first synthesized, and they used to give that out like candy. Uh, and then in the 1970s, people started to notice that about 20% of patients would develop diarrhea when they were on uh, clindamycin. So it was referred to as clindamycin-associated colitis or clindamycin-associated pseudomembranous colitis. So a group in, at WashU in St. Louis um, actually decided to start looking at this. And what they, uh, they looked at 200 consecutive patients given clindamycin for various reasons that were not specified in this particular paper. 21% uh, of them developed diarrhea. And so every single one of them who developed diarrhea got a, a colonoscopy. And it was the middle author who gave the colonoscopy, actually, because he was the GI fellow at the time. Uh, they noted that 10% of them had pseudomembranes present, uh, and so, but all of them resolved their diarrhea with cessation of the uh, antibiotic, uh, the, the clindamycin. So this actually led to a black box warning on clindamycin saying that it can cause pseudomembranous colitis. Now in the study, they actually, they weren't dummies. They actually looked at what bacteria they could try to isolate in this, um, and they were unable to. They just found basic stool stuff because they weren't looking for Clostridioides difficile at the time, but they were checking on uh, anaerobic routine anaerobic cultures on blood agar as opposed to looking for C. diff specifically. In fact, it wasn't until 1978, four years after this paper, that's when people noticed that uh, uh, that's when people identified C. diff as the causative organism of this. Uh, this is a classic picture of the pseudomembranes themselves. You see these yellowish plaques, which are just cellular debris from the uh, um, uh, apoptotic endothelial cells. And microscopically, it looks like this. And you can see the level of edema and uh, debris on top of the goblet cells from the pseudomembrane. Incidentally, um, that middle author right there, Robert W. Barton, uh, when I was preparing this talk a few years back, uh, one of the other times I was home for Christmas and my mom said, you should, put, you should put your dad's paper in your talk about C. diff. So now I can say that I have. He makes, you know, bright kids, I'm going to say. Uh, so continuing on with C. diff, uh, the epidemiology of it, it's on the rise. Uh, there have been over four, uh, in 2011, there were over 400,000 cases of Clostridioides difficile in the United States alone. And it was associated with only 700 deaths in the late 1990s, but over 29,000 deaths in 2011. And we have more recent data that, again, is showing that this is continuing to rise. So this is both the United States and worldwide. And you can see that in all age populations, this is also continuing to go up as we continue to give antibiotics. And it's interesting because this is actually basically uh, evolutionary biology in action here, where we're seeing this bacterium, as soon as we develop an antibiotic, gradually the bacterium develops resistance to the antibiotic. And then we have to switch antibiotics and it continues to get progressively more virulent uh, and more resistant simultaneously. It's like the Borg from Star Trek in that way, you know? Um, and resistance is, is actually a thing. It's not futile. Uh, so risk factors, obviously, 98% of patients will have had an antecedent antibiotic within 90 days prior to starting, uh, prior to developing C. diff uh, infection. IBD patients are at risk because of the pre-existing endothelial injury, obviously. Um, there are a number of risk factors there. The most clear association of very clearly is antibiotic use. Uh, in particular, second, third, and fourth generation cephalosporins, although, again, fluoroquinolones are on the rise. Clindamycin we don't use as often, but that was the classic answer historically. And even now, metronidazole into, uh, resistance is on the rise in C. diff, and so that can induce C. diff. And we've all seen a patient before who got like one dose of ANCEF for their orthopedic surgery who wound up with fulminant C. diff before. It does happen. Obviously, being in a healthcare uh, facility is an independent risk factor for developing a uh, Clostridioides difficile infection as well. And in healthcare settings uh, in that regard, again, transmission is more common. Uh, there are data, generous data, that say that appendectomy may increase your risk as well, with the theory behind it being that the gut biome reservoir function of the ap appendix is what prevents C. diff. And so once you've had an appendectomy, you're at a higher risk of either the disease or of more virulent strains of it. In addition, there's uh, some theories that acid suppression therapy may, uh, may lead to this. So if you're on chronic PPI, or chronic H2 block or more of the bacterium is able to survive the stomach and it, increased, it may increase your risk as well. Again, those are a little bit more iffy, but it's abundantly clear that the number one risk factor is antibiotic use. The presentation of the disease, 
Uh, as a rule, generally speaking, they won't even send the sample for it unless somebody has had watery diarrhea with at least three or more bowel movements per day. But unfortunately, C. diff can also sometimes present with an ileus, especially if it's fulminant. So that sort of complicates things. Um, let's see. Uh, typically, patients will have that antibiotic use. They'll have a leukocytosis. Often, the leukocytosis will be quite high. So when you see these patients have low-grade fevers, but a fever, uh, but a white blood cell count of 28,000, you can always think of C. diff in that situation. And it's especially true that it can sneak up on you in patients who have had, a, in this population of people I'm talking to right now, patients who have had a right colectomy, because they're inherently, after having a right colectomy, going to have looser bowel movements. And then you say, oh, it's just, it's fine. It's just a right colectomy. But no, it's actually Clostridioides difficile. Uh, patients can have tachycardia, abdominal distension. They can have a massive septic response because of this toxin-mediated sepsis as well. The fevers are generally going to be less than 38 degrees Celsius, of course, um, but the leukocytosis being high should always increase your index of suspicion. This is a nice CT image. The imaging, routine imaging is not necessary, obviously, but this CT image shows a nice example of thumb printing and significant edema of the colon wall here with minimal involvement of the small intestine. You can get some backwash ileitis with this. It's uncommon, but certainly heard of to see patients with uh, Clostridioides difficile enteritis. Uh, the one case I can think of off the top of my head, usually a patient already has an ileostomy at that point. Uh, and the one case I can think of was like that and had an ileus as their presenting sign. Well, a number of tests have been historically used for C. diff, including, you know, two-day consecutive positive tests, et cetera. These days, the ASCARS guidelines do recommend a confirmatory test, but usually a nucleic acid amplifying test, a PCR, is your go-to for this. Uh, there are GDH uh, enzymatic assays as well. People used to do toxins, toxigenic cultures, all these other things, but basically all of those are out. You know, and there's no need to retest after the resolution of the symptoms because it'll usually come back positive. You know, the insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. Uh, incidentally, that was actually not attributed to Albert Einstein until the 1980s, and there's no evidence whatsoever that he said that. So these days, the recommendation is uh, PCR testing for toxins A and B. Uh, and or the uh, GDH testing, which is um, uh, the dehydrogenase activity uh, enzymatic assay. And you should get a confirmatory study, but one positive study is enough to start a therapy. Uh, as far as C. diff colitis and in the actual infection, uh, it just depends on how bad it is, basically how you're going to treat it. So, you know, uh, we're sort of going to go through non-severe, severe, fulminant, and then we'll discuss recurrent as we go. Uh, these have been updated because of the 2021 guidelines for the, uh, from ASCARS. Um, so step one, if you're able to, obviously, cessation, cessation of antibiotics is one of the critical steps for non-severe Clostridioides difficile. Uh, the sooner you can get the gut biome to recover, the less opportunistic this, uh, opportunities the C. diff will have. Uh, as far as antibiotic therapy goes, uh, oral vancomycin and oral fidaxomycin are now considered first line. As of just a few years ago, until 2021's guidelines, uh, metronidazole was considered first line, but that is out now. And that's an important thing for all of you to note at this point, because we still see patients getting uh, flagell all the time. But that is no longer considered adequate first line therapy due to a higher failure rate and a higher uh, percent of patients with resistance, uh, with resistance strains of uh, C. diff. Uh, a 10-day course is appropriate. We'll talk about all the mechanisms of the mechanisms of action of some of these as well. So Vanco should be given in non-severe C. diff at 125 micro, uh, milligrams four times daily by mouth. Vancomycin is great because uh, the MIC in the colon for uh, to kill Clostridioides difficile is like one to two micrograms per milliliter. And if you drink 125 milligrams of vancomycin, the, MIC, the uh, level of vancomycin in your colon lumen is about 350 to 400 micrograms per milliliter. So we are massively overdosing this to kill the, uh, vancomycin, uh, to kill the uh, bug, thankfully. Uh, we usually don't need to go up to a 500 milligram dose of uh, vancomycin four times daily because of that. You're usually making MIC without too much difficulty. Now, interestingly, there is cost associated with vancomycin. The uh, orally ingested formulation of vancomycin isn't cheap, but you can go to a compounding pharmacy. If your hospital has a compounding pharmacy, uh, get the IV form just put into liquid form instead, and that's a bit of a less expensive way to go about that. How low is my battery right now? We're going to keep on chugging, and if this dies, then I can be ashamed. Uh, so fidaxomycin or deficit as its trade name, uh, is, a sec is another first-line antibiotic. And that's just 200 milligram tablets. 
uh, twice a day. So it's actually pretty uh, simple in that regard. The problem is it's expensive. A single course of fidaxomycin costs between $1,000 and $1,500. Um, it is a targeted therapy uh, that binds to the uh, switch regions of bacterial RNA polymerase, uh, and it's targeted towards C. diff, interestingly. So it's actually pretty a uh, pretty narrow spectrum antibiotic. Uh, there are some studies that show that it may have a lower recurrence rate as well uh, when compared directly with vancomycin for recurrent C. diff. Uh, and it has minimal systemic absorption. So again, it has few side effects in that way. A study that actually looked at these New England Journal back in 2011 uh, actually showed here's the uh, cure rate, which was similar in vancomycin and fidaxomycin. Both of them cured this about 90% of the time. Uh, but the recurrence rate for fidaxomycin was about 15 and 13 uh, percent, whereas the uh, um, recurrence rate with uh, vancomycin was about 25 percent, which is consistent with other studies. C. diff recurrence occurs in about 25 to 28 percent of patients. Of course, that means the number needed to treat the, uh, is uh, about 10. So that means about 10 to 15 thousand dollars to prevent a single recurrence of C. diff. So there is a notable uh, um, cost associated with this. As far as metronidazole goes, it can still be given because it's low cost and readily available, but it should not be relied on as considered first line therapy because it has a lower cure rate of only about 80% at this point. As both you saw, the other two medications have a 90% success rate. And unfortunately, the success rate for flagell is decreasing instead of increasing. Now, metronidazole is readily absorbed by the, blood, uh, by the uh, GI tract, unlike vancomycin and fidaxomycin, which arrive at colon in their intact form. It's actually, though, then mostly excreted through the urine, but the 10 to 15 percent that's fecally excreted is done in its active form after being excreted through the biliary tree. So that's why we can give uh, um, flagell uh, through the IV is because it's ex excreted in its active form through the biliary tree and then still arrives in the colon at MIC most of the time. Although because of differences, again, you know, differences in metabolism and in excretion rate actually make it less consistent in terms of its concentration and arrival in the biliary, in the uh, colon lumen, uh, which may be one contributing factor to its lower success rate is just individual uh, metabolism rates. So again, due to the high failure rate, this is no longer recommended as a first line therapy for non-severe clostridiotis difficile infection. I feel like I've said that a lot now. There's a new kit on the block too, which is bezlituximab. Uh, Bezlituximab is a human monoclonal antibody that actually targets those crop regions that I mentioned earlier in toxin B. Uh, the dosing for it is 10 milligrams per kilogram body weight with a single infusion, and it's been shown to, it's not uh, for the acute C. diff, uh, but it's to prevent recurrence rate or lower recurrence rate. And you can see here it lowers recurrence rate by about 11% in a randomized double-blinded study. Uh, this is reserved for high-risk patients. So that means the immunocompromised population, patients who recently had IVIG therapy, uh, HIV, things like that. Uh, and that's not just, but but partly because it costs over $4,000 per dose. Uh, and that's, by my standards, a lot of money. Um, so it, it, it does, however, show potential for targeted therapies for um, uh, to the toxins uh, for C. diff. And so it's pretty exciting in the C. diff world. Uh, things to keep in mind, regardless of anything else having to do with what antibiotic you choose and so forth, one of the most important parts of this is anatomy. Uh, and this is always a fun one to discuss with infectious disease doctors or, you know, whoever else. Because they often are like, oh, well, the patient's on IV vancomycin, it's fine. But the problem is unless the patient's having a lower gastrointestinal bleed, the IV vancomycin that's at MIC in the bloodstream is not at MIC in the colon. And so patients who often have things like uh, diverting ileostomies, uh, you can't get the uh, um, vancomycin to the colon once they're diverted, but you can treat the ostomy bag very well with high rates of failure. Um, additionally, bowel function in these patients. So you can give vancomycin retention enema in patients who have an ileus, and that can have a fairly high success rate, a 500 milliliter uh, enema given at a... Um, given at any given moment and trying to hold it for at least 30 minutes, uh, can reach a, a proximal to the splenic flexure sometimes, um, but maybe a good way to at least initiate therapy in the setting of acute disease. Um, compliance. One of the problems with giving vancomycin enemas, most patients don't want to give themselves a 500 milliliter retention enema four times a day. Uh, additionally, metronidazole tastes terrible and makes people nauseated. Uh, it has a bitter metallic taste. Uh, vancomycin is four times daily, whereas fidaxomycin is only twice daily, and so people do prefer that. 
And you do have to maintain compliance for your 10-day course for this. Volume status obviously is important in these patients because of their severe diarrhea. It's almost like cholera where they're, you know, lying on the bed, pooping their, so themselves like crazy. And so you do have to keep them hydrated as well to maintain their uh, volume status, avoid the ileus and so forth. As far as severe C. diff goes, so the IDSA has specific things that they, Infectious Disease Society of America has specific things that they suggest do imply severe C. diff, things like a white blood cell count greater than 15,000, a serum creatinine that's increased to greater than 1.5, so an acute kidney injury associated with the volume status changes or sepsis, uh, worsening abdominal pain and distension, although these are a little bit hand wavy. Uh, anybody who has IBD by definition has severe C. diff. Um, and so for those patients, now, ASCAR says these are things that may be associated with severe C. diff, but don't make them hard and fast rules, essentially. Uh, C. diff is severe if you think it's severe. Uh, and that gets back to sort of the eyeball test part of this. Uh, when patients do have severe C. diff, then you can still give 125 milligrams of vancomycin as a trial, but may need to go to 500 milligrams QID. And you can add metronidazole as an adjunct to the vancomycin, so you can do dual therapy. You can also give fidaxomycin again, which is expensive and not always available, but is a good antibiotic for this. Uh, again, bezatoximab should be given to anybody who's uh, uh, at high risk uh, if it's available, but the availability of that medication is, again, dicey. I will tell you, I do not believe the Kaiser system has it, for example, and I haven't tried to order it yet. And again, we're talking about a 10-day course, but often these patients will be hospitalized at the time to keep, keep an eye on them with serial exams. Uh, there are, of course, data that suggest that even in severe C. diff uh, or even in mild C. diff, a, an early surgical con, uh, consultation is important. So I have general surgery residents, which means they see these patients and blow them off all the time. Uh, it is important, especially in our world as colorectal surgeons, to keep a close eye on these patients because uh, very often we are not consulted as surgeons until the patient is already, you know, the chest compressions have started and they say we think the patient needs surgery at this point which makes it a little harder because it's a, a lot of movement that's going on at the same time. Fulminant C. diff is one of these things that's a little bit difficult to define. define. Obviously, hypotension, shock, ileus, and megacolon distension uh, are hard and fast signs, but it's one of those things where it's, it's an eyeball test situation as well. Uh, this does require patients have oral vancomycin 500 milligrams four times daily and, re and retention enemas is not a bad idea. And you should also be giving IV metronidazole at that time. These patients are sick. Uh, and realistically, again, we should be consulted earlier than the medicine doctors think because oftentimes we wind up not consulted until it's too late. Uh, and the surgery rates for this disease, uh, the mortality rate associated with surgery we're going to get into shortly, but it's bad. Um, yeah, as far as what it takes to sort of get upgraded, this guy is Associate Justice Potter Stewart. He's a prior uh, uh, justice on the Supreme Court back in the 60s, 70s, thereabouts. Uh, he retired in the early 1980s. And one of the two things he's most famous for is actually that when he retired, Sandra Day O'Connor then became the first woman on the bench. But arguably the thing he's most famous for is a uh, a consenting uh, uh, verdict in one of the cases that he was looking at in the 19, in 1964. So in 64, the Supreme Court was looking at a case of pornography. That was the lawsuit anyway. A, a local theater in Ohio was showing a, a French film that ended with a sex scene. Uh, and people were suing saying they were showing porn, uh, whereas the uh, Supreme Court ruled that it was an integral part of the film, that it was not pornographic, and that it was... Um, uh, it was under, uh, protected under free speech. Now, Potter Stewart at the time said, I shall not attempt to further define this uh, hardcore porn, and perhaps I could never succeed in intelligibly doing so, but I know it when I see it in the motion picture involved, this is not it. So this is the sort of, I know it when I see it, and this isn't it uh, saying. That's where this derived from is all from Potter Stewart, which he honestly, apparently at the time of his death, wished he was not as famous for because he thought he had other quips that were more intelligent. Fulminant C. diff has got to be a I know it when I see it kind of thing. And you can say this is not it, but you got to have a high index of suspicion that this is it because in early intervention is what's going to save these patients' lives. That was a nice long roundabout way to get to that. Uh, but the good news is most of these patients won't need surgery. Only about 1% of patients with Clostridioides difficile ultimately wind up in the operating room for the disease and less than 30% of severe cases. Although if you look at the literature, anywhere from two to 86% will wind up with a colectomy or will wind up with surgery uh, for clostridioides C. diff once they are severe. Uh, 
So that's somewhere between zero and 100% of the literature, which is makes the literature a lot less useful in that situation. As far as who should get surgery, um, oh yeah, it's obviously it's more common with these epidemics uh, subtypes or the ribotypes of uh, C. diff, the 027, 078, and 017 strains. Uh, but I don't think anybody's routinely testing for those in advance to see if they're going to get a surgery. They're just watching the patient and treating accordingly. There are hard and fast indications for surgery. Obviously, perforation is number one. And if the, the colon is perforated, the segment of colon needs to come out. The idea of organ preservation and setting of a perforation is inadvisable in this situation. Ischemia of the colon, obviously, is a hard indication as well. Uh, severe uncontrollable sepsis in spite of anti adequate antibiotic therapy is an indication. Again, this is a toxin-mediated uh, toxin disease, which means there can still be toxin uh, present, even if you've cleared the bacterium to some degree. And very commonly, a failure to improve. So these are the patients who are on maximal therapy for five days. They're not dying in front of you, but they're not improving. And that's when you just have to bite the bullet and do an operation. There are some data that suggest that a recent surgery is in a higher risk of failure in these situations and may mask some of the other things. Uh, patients who already have pneumoperitoneum due to a recent open operation, which I guess the fellows these days don't do anyway, it's not robotic. Uh, and then, uh, um, but then develop perforation as well. That can lead to complication. Uh, again, there are no, it's hard to get a high quality study on all this though, because you're not gonna randomize patients to surgery or not surgery in this situation. You just kind of have to, do it eventually. And then IBD patients, again, the patients with either UC or Crohn's colitis are inherently at higher risk of failure of management of non-operative therapy in the setting of C. diff because of the pre-existing mucosal injury that just leads to increased virulence of the disease. IVIG and immunosuppression. This is actually one of the ones that I will give an anecdote. I'm trying to avoid anecdotes intentionally, but I get to give an anecdote about this uh, in, a, in just a couple minutes. Both IDSA and, and ASCARS, oh, I forgot to update this one on the ASCARS, my reference. Um, both of them recommend at this point that the surgery of choice is likely total abdominal colectomy with an endoleostomy. Uh, this is high morbidity, but it's interesting because even when you're doing this operation, as you start to come across the vessels uh, and divide the venous outflow of the, of the um, colon, you can see patient sepsis improving fairly rapidly because the toxins are no longer making it to the liver and beyond because of likely because of the severity of the disease by the time we get around to operating uh, the morbidity and mortality from this operation are quite high and we're often operating on older patients who wind up with an ileostomy and so forth uh, the rectal stump can be very difficult to manage as you can see in this uh, photograph these colons can be quite large it can take multiple firings of staplers to come across a rectosigmoid stump and very often the easiest thing to do for management is to bring up the mucus fistula to the lower portion of the midline incision. That provides the advantage as well that you can leave a malacot tube or a red rubber catheter in the uh, mucus fistula and continue anti-grade vancomycin enemas with easier access than the anus, uh, which can help treat the residual intoxicated lumen and that poor lumen is apparently still intoxicated. And I'm sure that many of us have seen patients who have a total abdominal colectomy and persist with leukocytosis fever and even sepsis because of the residual rectum. Uh, you can usually treat the rectum more easily though because of direct uh, administration of the vancomycin, which again is well above MIC when you dump it directly into the colon like that. The other nice thing about this operation is usually because they're so big and floppy, it doesn't take very long. These uh, colectomies are the kind that, you know, my boss does in 20 minutes and the rest of us do in about 40 minutes. So. And so uh, they can be pretty straightforward at least, but the problem is, you know, while you're doing it and chest compressions are ongoing, you can be a pretty shaky field. Now, Zuckerbron's group back in 2011 presented a paper at a, um, uh, what was it? This was a double AST, uh, looking at loop ileostomy with integrated in, in, uh, irrigation instead. And so what they described was in patients with fulminant C. diff, they would do a loop ileostomy, pass a malacop tube through the distal limb into the cecum, and while in the operating room, uh, irrigate with eight liters of warmed colite with a rectal tube in place so that they could flush out the contents of the colon with the theory that they were reducing the bacterial load, reducing the toxin exposure. And then while still in the operating room, pass the first antigrade vancomycin enema and then continue those for 10 days afterwards. Having done this exactly once before, I will tell you, the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, does not have a chapter about giving eight liters of colite integrate in the operating room. 
it stinks. With that said, in their accrual period, they accrued 48 patients, six of whom went on to come for care in the original study. The mortality rate in the study population was 19%, and when compared to historical controls who had a 50% uh, mortality, uh, Zuckerberg's group said this is a reasonable thing to do. Uh, this was the first small study, though, on this topic, and they found that three patients uh, out of the 48 that they had, 42 actually underwent the operation, uh, three progressed to total abdominal colectomy. Nine, uh, 15 ileostomies out of the 19 that were uh, present were reversed, and there was one patient who had recurrent disease afterwards. Again, all of these things are fairly in line with the data, except that this was something new and exciting. So it gained popularity in the early 20-teens. Subsequent to this, Nisquip has actually looked at this, and uh, a Nisquip study that was performed by Hall and uh, Hall's group in uh, 2019 uh, looked at this and found 457 patients who underwent a collect who underwent surgery of some kind within the 2011-2016 Nisquip timeframe uh, for C diff as their uh, diagnosis, and they found 47 got loop ileostomy and 410 got total abdominal colectomy. And uh, interestingly, if you look at a NISQIP, it, it does not specify because it used CPT codes between endoleostomy and primary anastomosis, but it was presumed in this paper that all of those patients got endoleostomy. They found that the uh, operative times were shorter with the loop ileostomy than with the endo, uh, endoleostomy procedure. Uh, they also found that uh, this is not a great slide. I, I should have left this out. Uh, this is a big table. Uh, they found that the two groups, the loop ileostomy group and the total abdominal colectomy group, were dissimilar. Uh, and so it's harder for them to draw conclusions. There were significant differences within the two groups uh, in terms of ASA scores, et cetera. The post-operative complications for the two groups uh, were also fairly similar overall. Um, there have been a number of studies since then. Basically, at the end of the day, ASCAR's guidelines say that there's a grade 2C recommendation that you can consider this as a possible alternative and similarly, IDSA says that it, you know, there's low quality evidence, but it can be considered as an alternative to total abdominal colectomy. Now I get to my anecdote. I've done this once, uh, and the one time that I did it, uh, the reason we opted to was because the patient was already sick, not floridly septic, but not improving, neutropenic at the time because of metastatic, uh, because of recurrent breast cancer and undergoing chemotherapy at the time. And so we thought, well, if we do a loop ileostomy, it's less surgery for her and so forth. And so we did. Uh, and thankfully, I had a fourth year medical student, so that meant somebody was able to give the eight liters of colite while I sat there and watched at that point. These patients are quite distended at the time, so it can be a bear to find the to do the loop ileostomy laparoscopically. Everybody makes out like it's really easy. It's not. Uh, moreover, uh, in that particular patient, and at the time, by the way, I was advocating for this hard. Uh, and then a week later, that patient started leaking succus out of her front. Uh, we wound up taking her back for the completion total abdominal colectomy because she really wasn't improving anyway. And that's when we saw the perforated duodenal ulcer as well. And so it really did, it begs the question for me, if we had managed the sepsis better, would that patient have not perforated an ulcer at the time? And again, it's hard to randomize patients in this situation. So we're not going to get good quality evidence. So I would say that this is an option to use judiciously. And more importantly, if surgeons are consulted earlier in the course of C. diff and it's clear that patients are failing, this is certainly not an unreasonable option. Uh, but if you've got one shot, take your one shot and make it count. Moving on to recurrent C. diff. Uh, for first recurrence, the current recommendations are basically, so this can occur in up to 30% of patients, somewhere in that range. A lot of patients with C. diff wind up with recurrent C. diff because it's still hanging out in there. Uh, by, it's defined as positive assay within two to eight weeks. The problem is positive assays are going to happen, but it's the recurrent symptoms, really. Uh, risk factors include IBD, advanced age, recurrent or persistent antibiotics. Nobody's quite sure if this is repeat intoxication or persistent disease, and so it's kind of one of these debated topics. Uh, it's kind of chicken or eggy, to be honest. Uh, it could be a new source, or it could be just residual spores after they survive the vancomycin 10-day course. How to treat recurrence? Well, basically, don't do the same thing again. Uh, so the therapy is going to be based on your initial therapy, your prior therapy. If somebody did give metronidazole, start with vancomycin. Uh, if somebody gave vancomycin, you can do pulse-dose vancomycin, uh, which sort of uh, the guidelines, there are a million different pulse-dosing options, and often ID has one at your institution. There'll be QID dosing followed by two weeks of BID dosing, followed by daily dosing for a couple weeks, and then let it go. Uh, 
uh, or if they had vancomycin, you can switch to fidaxomycin at the time. If they have fidaxomycin first run, you can switch to vancomycin at the time. Uh, basically, change it up though. You can add toxin binders. Again, you know, these used to be in the guidelines. I didn't see them this time through. There's going to be a debate about probiotic versus antibiotic in this situation. And these days, probiotics are not recommended in the setting of acute C. diff. There's a theoretical risk of uh, bacterial translocation in the setting of the uh, uh, colitis and the, the active colitis with the endothelial injury. And if you give somebody yogurt, they will probably not have issues realistically. And, you know, acidophilus makes it through the stomach. So that's always, uh, you know, this is a future direction kind of thing. So people can get multiple uh, recurrences and the more recurrences you've had, the more likely you're going to recur again. So uh, risk of recurrence after your initial infection, 18%. After you've had one recurrence, you have a 45% risk of having further recurrences uh, and so forth and so on. So people are inherently at higher risk for developing more recurrences as they go. How do we treat that? Well, often first line therapy is pulse dose antibiotics and they haven't even made it to you by then. Uh, so that'll be the old two weeks of antibiotics on, two weeks off, or things like that. Various ways to try to improve your gut biome while still eradicating Clostridioides difficile. And then there's fecal microbiota transplantation. So this is the fun part of the talk. Uh, there have been multiple studies looking at fecal microbiota transplantation. One of the most interesting parts about it is that there's no consensus on how best to instill the fecal microbiota from the donor into the, into the recipient patient. So these studies used enema, uh, colonoscopy. Some people used a nasojejunal or nasoduodenal tube, which I think it's just going to make your breath smell like shit, but that's just me. Um, even endoscopic uh, upper endoscopy with uh, installation directly into the duodenum or jejunum uh, of donor stool, uh, as well as there's, no, there's been no um, standardization of how to donate this or how to process the donor stool. And we'll get to pictures of that too. Uh, so there have been a number of ways this has been done. It's actually had pretty good results in recurrent C. diff, of all things. And in fact, there was one randomized controlled trial that looked at about 19 patients in each arm, excuse me, 16 patients and 13 patients in their respective arms. And what it found was that with the first, uh, first use of donor stool, there was an 80% success rate, and two of the three patients who had persistent disease uh, resolved their recurrent C. diff with a second installation of, uh, of um, a donor stool in the FMT arm, whereas in the pulse dose antibiotic arm, recurrence rates were basically the same as the first time you get vancomycin, which was uh, 30, 20 to 30%. The most interesting part of this paper, I thought, was that they actually looked at the um, uh, fecal microbiota, um, uh, the flora of patients before and after infusion of the uh, donated stool, as well as the uh, fecal um, uh, diversity of bacteria of the donors. And what they found in this uh, right-hand slide is our photo is that uh, the patients who uh, received the infusion were more similar afterwards in their uh, microbiota to donors than they were before, which again shows that it actually works. The bacteria you shove in there actually stick around. So that was kind of exciting. It's kind of a neat way to look at that, I thought. Uh, so based on that, study alone, fecal microbiota transplantation became uh, recommended based on strong uh, evidence with a, a high quality study in the IDSA guidelines, even back in 2017, and in the ASCARS guidelines as well. Uh, interestingly, most recently, re Rebiota uh, was approved by the FDA in 2022, which is a slurry that you can get commercially of donated stool. Um, it is not cheap. I don't think I made a slide specifically for it, but it's about $4,000 for a single dose, um, which is a sort of expensive way to go about getting this. Um, it is a, I, I made a joke as soon as I saw this seeing Rebiota and thinking about my, my poor little Toyota downstairs getting a bad name because of it. Um, excuse me, it's $9,500 for a single dose of it. So that's very expensive. It'll make you say, holy shit. And then you'll think that the donor may be a priest or something. Um, all joking aside, interestingly, this has not been looked at. There are no specific restrictions for diet on donors for this, which is pointed out on the website for Rebiota, which means that uh, I don't know the effects of gluten consumption or whether or not vegans would accept this if the donor is not vegan, but there are no restrictions in that way. Keep it in mind, I live in Oregon, so I have to think about these things. So these are actual photos uh, provided by a gastroenterologist who was in charge of the Brigham's uh, FMT program. And so I, I 
requested these from her and she very generously gave them to me and they're fun to show sort of the if you're not willing to use rebiota for ninety five hundred dollars and give an enema how do you get the stool and so you take the donated stool first and you buy a cheap blender uh, goodwill sells blenders for a few dollars that usually work okay you blend it up in about 500 milliliters of saline and then pass it through a strainer that you also got at goodwill don't use the one in your kitchen you probably won't use it again honestly uh, once you've done that and strained out the particulate matter, all you have to do is suck it up into a bunch of 60 cc syringes so that it looks like this, which is kind of horrifying. And the way they do it at Brigham is they actually do a colonoscopy at the time, of, you know, between episodes of recurrent C. diff, uh, get to the cecum and then start instilling it there so that the entire colon gets instilled with the donor, uh, uh, the donor stool. Every place has a little bit different uh, recommendations on who's going to be a donor, how to be a donor, and so forth. Um, and... Uh, Interestingly, there was an NPR report about 10 years or so ago uh, about a kid in Oregon who had like the golden stool biome for this kind of thing. And he was, uh, his friends wanted him to donate to them so that they could then also donate for money uh, for this situation. And it became an ethical debate because of the financial incentive there. So it's kind of interesting. Neither here nor there, but very interesting. So some conclusions. Number one, have a high index of suspicion for the disease here. So, uh, Clostridia is difficile, can be insidious and should be treated early. Number two, keep in mind that it's intraluminal therapy for an intraluminal disease. And this is something the medicine doctors often forget. So we as surgeons need to make sure to emphasize that this uh, the antibiotic is ineffective if, if it never actually reaches the lumen of the colon. Uh, oral vancomycin should probably be first-line therapy. Uh, fidaxomycin can be first-line therapy if it's readily available to you, but it, there is a cost difference there. Uh, metronidazole is no longer recommended as a first-line therapy. It is an adjunct to uh, vancomycin in severe disease, and bezlatoximab may reduce the risk of recurrence. Uh, surgery is for refractory disease, severe disease, or perforation, ischemic bowel, et cetera. Uh, recurrence can be treated with antibiotics again, but honestly, FMT seems to have better outcomes at this point, so we should have a high, uh, a, um, low uh, threshold for moving patients towards FMT if they're interested in not having C. diff anymore. There are a bunch of future directions this can go, which is exciting. Obviously, colon preservation therapy with loop ileostomy is in its uh, nascent phases, I say 12 years into the process and less than 100 years into the identification of the bacterium at all. Uh, but the potential for both doing a loop ileostomy earlier in the disease process and then treating the colon directly, as well as having access for installation of uh, fecal microbiota transplantation more easily there in an integrated fashion, has potential there. Uh, obviously, prevent whether or not we can start preventing the disease with probiotics or using small molecule or additional monoclonal antibody therapy for toxin mediation and not just reduction of recurrence risk would be great. Uh, FMT in acute disease is going to be studied and it's probably being studied right now. And then the optimal delivery system, uh, the rebiota is only uh, given through an enema. And so we're not sure how far it actually makes it up there or the changes in the microbiota um, that we see when compared with uh, the colonic colonoscopic installation. And then as well, there are going to be long-term implications of fecal microbiota transplantation eventually. I'm happy to field questions at this point. I have 10 minutes until I get signed out for call. Thank you so much. That was really an incredible talk. And I definitely learned things just like you said, your chief president did um, on Friday when you gave him the talk. I have uh, one comment and then a question while we wait for other things to pop in. Um, so I did my residency at the University of Minnesota and we're a big center for FMT. And one thing that I just wanted to throw out for the viewers is that FMT can actually be very um, dangerous for patients. You can, similar to other transplants, you can have a very significant inflammatory reaction that can lead to sepsis and death. And so you just have to be aware of that uh, if you are uh, pursuing FMT in your patients. Um, pertinent because these patients do have an underlying endothelial injury from the clostridioides infection. So, you know, this shouldn't be just done willy nilly. This should be done at places that actually have experience with it. Yeah. My then question was, there was the big uh, JAMA paper, I think last month that talked about VE303. And uh, as I've been perusing it, I don't quite understand it, to be quite honest. It doesn't look like it is FMT. Are you familiar with this paper at all? 
I have not pulled up this paper. Somebody put it on Twitter <laughs> thing for this. And since I don't have a Twitter account, my friends were texting me to make fun of the, uh, me about this. I meant to pull this up. Let's see now. So it talks about them instilling like a group of Clostridia um, bacteria, at least that's my understanding, in patients who have recurrent C. diff in a um, phase two trial, random control, randomized clinical trial. And it seemed like it had some efficacy, but it looked like it was maybe not exactly a true FMT, but a more specialized version of it. And so I was just curious if you had heard of it and if that was going to make any waves or if it was still kind of early in the process. It sounds based on your description, like it's early in the process. And I think that uh, it's one that I'm going to have to include in a, any talks in the future on this. So, you know, thanks a lot. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, I don't see any other questions uh, at the moment in either of our chats. And so I'll let you have a few minutes before you start your wonderful general surgery call, which I'm sure we're all very jealous that you're taking this evening. So exciting. Um, it looks like uh, Susie's question, you briefly alluded to small bowel C. diff. Can you talk more about this? Uh, something that uh, we test for in refractory, really high output. So it's interesting, you know, small bowel C. diff is very uncommon, although certainly every time any patient comes into the uh, ER with a high output ileostomy, the medicine team says the colostomy is putting out a lot, they have diarrhea and checks for C. diff. Uh, C. diff in the small intestine is uncommon, almost invariably only present in patients who have an ileostomy. And in my relatively limited experience with it. And I think that not a lot of people have a lot of experience with this. Um, because of the severity of C. diff to, for it to intoxicate the small bowel in the first place, uh, it seems to more commonly be associated with ileus rather than high output um, in the same way that uh, colonocytic um, C. diff uh, leads to high output uh, diarrhea. So again, you know, this is an index of suspicion kind of thing. Um, but it's, it's so uncommon. You really probably, you know, you might see a couple over the course of your career. I think the, the only patient I saw it in, and I remember this more better than I ought to, uh, was when I was an intern in May of 2009, uh, on a patient who had just had a neobladder created and wouldn't re you know, everything was not working. His neobladder was also not working because it was bowel and it was just angry from the ongoing ileus and the nerve, uh, issues with that. And we eventually checked him and he had a uh, small bowel C. diff. I can't remember why he had an ileostomy, but he leaked from something, I don't know. It's, uh, but it, it stood out in my mind for some reason, inexplicably. Uh, it's, I don't know, maybe the, uh, some of the other people currently on the talk have seen it more often than I have, but uh, I'm betting not a lot of people have a dozen patients with this in the past. Yeah, thank you. Um, any last words of advice to the fellows who are on the call a couple months out from taking their first job? I know you're at career course and that's kind of how we connected with you initially. Um, One of my uh, mentors a while back when I was getting ready to get started, he put it very well. He said, um, you're going to be calling a lot of people uh, from fellowship, from residency and so forth. Spread the wealth so that nobody has any idea how often you're calling people but we all know that you are calling us and that's okay. You know, you're going to, uh, he was describing his first anastomosis and, you know, it very much mirrored my first anastomosis. So I'll tell my story instead. You know, the anastomosis, I've got like a third year medical student or a second year resident or something in there with me, you know, uh, fire the stapler, take a look. I'm like, that's a good looking anastomosis. You know, why don't you call Arangio in? Hey, hey, Arangio, that's a pretty good looking anastomosis, isn't it? You know, now that you're here, why don't you throw some gloves on and feel this anastomosis too? We all want to be that person who walks across the tightrope while the ground is on fire underneath us, but you will have a safety net under you. We're all there to support you, your mentors, your friends, your uh, senior residents, your old mentors from fellowship, from residency, your partners, everybody. Uh, so even though you feel like you're isolated, you will be calling plenty of people, even though you're, you know, we talked about the Dunning-Kruger curve before we started, rec uh, um, uh, started recording. And you're sort of, uh, when you're about to finish fellowship, you're at just such a high, and then you take your, you do your first case and you 
God forbid you have your first complication several months or years later, you know, some of us wait weeks to have an anastomotic leak. Um, and that gets you into the valley of despair pretty quickly on that Dunning-Kruger curve, but we all come out of it eventually. And you should be congratulated because it's tough to get a spot and it's tough to be here and it's a tough year for you, but you made it and you get to be welcomed to the club now. Thank you. And I really appreciate kind of normalizing the reaching out for, uh, to ask for help and, you know, calling your previous people, because I think that cannot be underscored enough. We still do it. All of us talk to our partners about cases and things like that, you know, the Dunning-Kruger curve again. <laughs> thank you again for the invitation. I very much appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. Enjoy your night of call and good night, everyone else. <laughs> Have a good one.